All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Ryan England, who is in Nashville, Tennessee. How are you doing, Ryan? I'm doing great today. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. And Ryan is a passionate advocate for small to medium businesses and blue collar industries driven by a child that spent witnessing his father's tireless work as an owner operator with a decade of experience in corporate America and as a CEO of Core Matters, Ryan empowers business leaders to build amazingly productive companies by focusing on hiring and retaining the right people. And that's what we're going to talk about today is teaching SMBs how to hire better people faster. And, and let's start Ryan with I think hiring is probably one of the hardest things that any organization, whether it's a small business or a large business, just because our, our I mean, I'm, I'm always honest about it. Like I've hired tons of people over the years, right? Different businesses. And I can honestly say that the percentage of really good hires is way, way smaller than the percentage of mistakes I've made. Yeah. <laughs> why, do you, why do you think hiring is so hard? I mean, there's a bunch of reasons. I think the biggest reason, though, is we tend to not think about hiring or even recruiting until we have to. True. A key person leaves. We land that big job. We're like, oh, my gosh, I need someone yesterday. And so that's when we start recruiting and that's when we start our efforts. And pretty much at that point, we're desperate. And if they show up, they can fog a mirror. Sometimes that's <laughs> it. Right. <laughs> and we're like hired. And then yeah. we're like, we'll deal with any fallout later. And then six weeks later, we're like. Why did I do that again? Right? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. No, I, I, I totally agree with you. So what, what should we be doing? We should be looking at hiring as, as, as an ongoing kind of strategic strategic well, thing. I think the big shift I want to I want the listeners to hear is that if you stop thinking of recruiting as this HR activity, this check the box, this thing you have to do where you go look for people. And you start thinking a little bit more like a marketing activity and start treating it as more, I need to attract the right people. Mm -hmm. And you start thinking about recruiting as this activity of attracting good people to your business. All of a sudden, you don't need to go out looking for them. You don't need to be desperate. You're going to have a line of people. We call it the bench. You're right. going to have a bench of people just sitting there waiting for you to call them to join your team. And when you're in that position, you shift the power. And all of a sudden, as the employer, you're no longer desperate. You're no longer going to take whoever comes in front of you. You will be able to take your pick, which mm -hmm. creates an immense uh, amount of freedom and just removes a lot of the issues that come with recruiting. And I guess part of that is communicating why you should want to join the business, what's special about it. Because, I mean, I agree with you, but I think a lot of us, we're really poor at doing that part of it. It's like we're great at marketing maybe our product or our yeah. service or whatever, but we're very poor at marketing why you should want to come to work with us. I, I agree with that 100%. I think the, the thing about building a team and growing the company is that we're usually, as entrepreneurs, we're usually good at the thing that we sell. Mm -hmm. We're not good at building a team. We're not good at the communication unless we're selling team building. Right. We're not good at that. Even that, I will tell you, even though I teach people all over the world how to do this stuff, I still struggle with it. I still have to use my tools at some mm -hmm. of our systems because I, I need that help. Mm -hmm. And when we start thinking about the fact that most people, not everybody, but most people, they don't leave jobs. They leave people. Mm -hmm. And if we yeah. know that and we're looking for someone with experience, aka they've been in a job doing this line of work, mm -hmm. the reason they're leaving their current employer is not because of the job. They're leaving because of the people. So what we need to do to do a better job is say, let's talk about the people here. Let's talk about our company culture, the way we communicate, the way we behave, the way we lead, the way we invest in our people. And that will go so much further at helping you differentiate yourself in the marketplace. And yeah. most people are probably already doing this stuff. They just don't get credit for it. Yeah, or they or a lot of businesses uh, allow culture to grow organically and not really ever decide like what is our culture, what is the culture we want, why why do we want it that way, what kind of people is it going to is it going to attract, what kind of people do we want it to attract? So I think part of it too is doing. I mean, I'm sure when you work with businesses, sometimes part of it is like establishing what their culture actually is. 
it is one of the first things that we do is to get really clear because if you're not clear on it, you can't be intentional about it. Mm -hmm. And if you're not intentional, it's really hard to get that credit that I was talking about. Yeah. It's hard for people to take notice. And when you are clear about it and you're excited about it, it's really easy for you to go brag about it. Right. And put it out there because you're excited. Yeah. And, and I think the other thing too, because culture has been talked a lot about recently, I think sometimes people are falling into the trap of going, oh, this is the culture we should have. It sounds good, looks good, but it's not really us, but we'll pretend we'll put it on the website and whatever. Yeah. And then you end up in the situation where then if somebody joins you, they're like, well, it's not like the culture that you project outside. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's really important. Whatever culture you have, it's one that you own and you are happy with. Like, and it's, it's yours. Yeah, authenticity is the most important thing. We had a client we worked with years ago. Uh, they're no longer in business. And I think one of the reasons was because of the culture they embraced. But they were a very passive aggressive group of people. <laughs> and I was like, I can't help you guys because this isn't healthy for a whole bunch of reasons. They're like, yeah, but that's who we are. Like we enjoy <laughs> that kind of that fraternity type of picking on each other culture. Yeah. And I was like, good luck with you. You know? <laughs> But once we got clear sounds on like, that, sounds like they're an Irish company. <laughs> once, once we got clear on that and we put it out there and said, Hey, if you want to feel like you're hanging out with your fraternity brothers all the time, and you get to razz on each other and that's acceptable. But what? retention went through the roof performance. And believe right. it or not, there were people that thrive in that culture. You yeah. just got to be clear about it. And I think that's such a great example because I think that's so important that people understand that it's okay if your culture works for you. It may not be for everybody, but it, embracing it, you know, as long as it's not toxic, obviously. But but in the situation that you talked about there, there's people who excel in, in an environment like that. Like I said, coming from Ireland, that would be perfectly acceptable to me because we grow up <laughs> like razzing on each other nonstop. So, but for somebody else, that would be an awful environment, yeah. probably a terrible one to be in. Um, and I think so that's really important, I think, as you said, is is the culture piece. I think one of the other pieces, isn't it, uh, Ryan, you know, we run out to hire somebody because we really need them. And then we hire them, we bring them on, but then nobody wants to train them. Nobody wants to do, you know, you might have a sort of plan, onboarding plan. But let's face it, how many times have you started a job and it really kind of just been left to your own devices? Because like, oh yeah, I'll meet you on Thursday to talk about this. And meanwhile, you're just sitting there wondering like, okay, I'll figure out where the coffee machine is or something. Yeah. Because there's no real plan in place and nobody really wants to do the onboarding. Yeah, we, um, I think it's 13%. Just under 13% of employees say that their company did a good job onboarding. <laughs> it's crazy. We had a we had a company that they hired someone, and uh, and, and I'm not saying this is the reason she quit six sure. months later, but nobody took the time day one to show her where the restroom was, to show her where the break room was. She kind of walked around figuring out like, well, they do, do they even want to be here? And that mm -hmm. planted the seed for her every day she went to work. Do they even want me here? Do they mm -hmm. even want me to be a part of the team? Six months later, she quits. Yeah. And I think that's a great, that's a great example because I think so. And it's, and it's because everybody's busy and they're like, okay, we've hired Ryan. Cool. We've hired somebody on, but I'm busy with other stuff. And, you know, neglecting, as I said, the onboarding and leaving you to your own devices. It's not sometimes done deliberately, but it is a, it is an experience that people have. So yeah. and let's face it, when you're new, when you're brand new and it's compounded now, if you have obviously remote employees. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's even worse. <laughs> um, and that's the other thing, too. I think the reason a lot of companies are bringing people back from that remote world and saying you're coming back here is is not because it's always better to have people face to face and shoulder to shoulder. Yes, it can help. What it does is it takes a lot of the burden off of leadership. Mm -hmm. You yeah. have to be stronger leaders. You have to be better communicators when you have a remote workforce. Yeah. And I think a lot of organizations are like, no, you're busy. We don't have the time to teach you to be better leaders. So we're going to bring everybody back to the office because we know <laughs> that we can teach you to lead there by example. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with you. And it does require that extra effort. And I think sometimes people, a lot of times people, people overlook that. So yeah, I would say, you know, that is the onboarding, the training plan, the just the just the empathy for somebody new joining your organization, I think is something that, uh, you know, is overlooked far, too, far too often. Um, yeah. But also, um, I think part of it too is, is sometimes we look to hire people because maybe there's a couple of issues, but we don't define the role 
mm. well enough, right? We yeah. just go, this isn't working or I'm too busy for that or there's something else over there. So I create, I have a great example. I did a, I did a job interview way back when I was in Silicon Valley during the dot com. A dot com called me up, at, you know, said, got a new VP position or the recruiter and said, you know, we would love you to go over. So I interviewed the CEO and the executive team and afterwards came back to CEO and she asked me, she said, what do you think? And I said, honestly? And I said, uh, she goes, yeah, what do you think of the job? And I said, I think it's a job that, that is basically a composite of everything that all your other executives don't want to do or don't know how to do. And I think it's set up for failure. And she was yeah. like, all right, well, thank you for coming in. Recruiter wasn't that happy with me on the way home, but I said, but here, they pulled the job two weeks later. Yeah. And that and that's the thing. I, I see that happen a lot, right? It's, it's hey, we need to hire someone. What for? Um, all the stuff that no one else wants to do. Yeah. And they don't get clear on it. One of the things become very popular this year. So we used to do a lot around just we got to put people in front of the recruiters. We got to put people in front of the hiring managers. And now there's been a shift in the last year with the economy softening and everything else where people mm -hmm. are more focused on how do we get our people to produce? How do we get our people to stay engaged? How do we get our people to not leave us? Like right. That's more of the focus. And so in the last year, we've done a lot of what we call role packages where we say, okay, let's sit down and let's talk about acceptable behaviors for this role. Let's talk about the things that'll motivate someone in this role. Let's talk about the things that they're responsible for. Let's talk about all the activities that they have to do to achieve those responsibilities. And when we do that and we put together these role packages and we present them to the, the employee, like you just see their eyes light up. We actually have had been told stories of some people that have gone into tears because like happy tears. They're like, I've been wanting this level of clarity in what you expect from me and how you're going to measure my performance and what I need to do to perform well. And they just, they love that clarity, but we're so busy. Like you said, that sometimes it's just, we need somebody, let's put them in here. We'll figure it out as we go. And then we never do. Yeah. No, I love that piece about the clarity because as you said, as you said, that's not just for, uh, new employees that can be for existing existing employees as well, and there's nothing that people hate more than that kind of vague, not really knowing, saying, "Well, I know this is part of my job, but I've been asked to do this. I'm not sure what this part is." And and over time, I mean, if you've been around for a while, your job has probably morphed a lot, and but nobody has ever really explained to you the reasoning or where it's going. Yeah. And one of the things we talk about too, is how many hats are you wearing? Like we talk about that as entrepreneurs, we all wear 27 mm. hats, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you know what? A lot of times people on our team wear more than one hat. That's they true. don't realize it because no one's ever described it that way, but maybe there's a part of their job, 30% of their job that they just can't stand, but it's part of their job because that was on the job description. Mm -hmm. Well, that really is a different hat. It's a yeah. different box on the org chart. And when you realize that and you break them apart, you can go, oh, the reason you don't like that is because that hat does not look good on you. Right? <laughs> like, that hat does not fit well. Yeah. And when you do that, you can break it apart and go, now I get why this person's not performing. 70% of them I love, but mm -hmm. it's that 30% that's not going well. Let's find someone who really fits well with that 30%. And I think that's such, an, that's such a key point for everybody to take away is because we have this, and we're hardwired as humans for some reason, is that we have this idea of, of when we look at strengths and weaknesses, you know, we say, okay, look at Ryan, he's got the, these three strengths, but he's got all these other things that we need to work on. So we're going to focus on those instead of focusing on the things that Ryan does really well and trying to figure out how we can have him doing 90% of the time doing that or even 100%. And as you said, finding other people, but instead, oh, no, no, we'll try and focus on fixing the parts that you're never, ever going to be good at because you don't like it and it's not what you want to do. We did. We ha helped a company through an employee engagement survey where there was an opportunity for people to give real quantitative, qualitative feedback. And there was this overwhelming theme in people giving the feedback. And it was, why is it? that I do 10 things right and I never hear from management, but I do one thing wrong yeah. and I never hear the end of it. Yeah. And I mean, that sums up so many companies right now because yeah. we focus so much on the thing we don't want. We never give any effort. We've seen, we've had employees that during exit interviews, we asked them like, why'd you quit? Boss never said, thank you.
Yeah, I mean, it's so I, simple. I can believe that. So it's a yeah, and again, it's a kind of human nature thing that we need to overcome. It's this: uh, we're great at catching people out in their mistakes. We're terrible at catching people doing the right thing. It's uh, and, and being able to just sort of go, oh, listen, fantastic, well done, and the thank you. The thank you is so. Like, what does that cost you? Absolutely nothing. You should be doing it anyway. It should be natural to you, yeah, especially if you're a servant leader or whatever. It, it's amazing. But yeah, how often you, uh, you know, you're right. I mean, I mean, because most people's career experiences, yeah, it's like if you don't hear from the boss, that's a good thing because the only time you hear is when there's a mistake. Yeah, yeah, I hate that too. But that's part of some people's culture. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and you just got to be clear on it. We call we call some of those stuff. Uh, we call them divisive or accidental values you know these are the things that some people latch onto, and some people feel like it's nails on a chalkboard but yeah. unless we sit down and get really clear on how we behave and what acceptable behavior is we can't call out the bad stuff yeah yeah can't hold and, people and, accountable to it well no ab absolutely absolutely and uh, and and sometimes I, I worked at one stage for an organization and the ceo was uh he was a very good accountant really good on uh and if you were brought in, if you went in to talk to him about something, you brought a spreadsheet. If there was one mistake on it, the whole meeting was over, right? Oh, and yeah. and it and it was so frustrating because you know you weren't the quite the whiz that he was at these kind of things, but it's also like it wasn't the most important thing. Uh, the rest of it was. So I think you're right. I think there's a lot of times a lot of leaders have to take a look at their own behaviors and say, okay, what am I communicating? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is the uh, so the hiring manager or the hiring person, right? There's another area where people rarely have get trained or get any input or have any expertise. It's like some people maybe are naturally a little better at it than others. Most yeah. of us are terrible. It's just uh, it's something that you know when you get people move into management in the first time, you know, they're like, oh, I can't wait to interview somebody for a job, you know, I can be on the other side of the table. And then after a while, you realize this is horrible. I don't want to do this any, anymore because I'm, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a skill in itself, but we don't train people. No, you know, it's interesting. You, you made a comment about promoting someone to be a manager. Yeah. How many people do you know? How many employers <laughs> do you know that go, oh, we just promoted someone. We need to onboard them. <laughs> like we need to treat this like we just hired someone from the outside because they're in a completely different role. Mm -hmm. They're exposed to completely different things. The team looks at them completely different. We need to onboard them again. And we don't, we don't train them. We don't give them those skills. Uh, it's one of the things we do at core matters a lot is sit down with those hiring managers and say, let's role play an interview. Let's mm. talk through some of these questions. Let's talk about how you can respond to these questions and not from a compliance perspective, because there's a whole bunch of stuff out there for that. Yeah. How do you actually connect and engage with someone in the interview so you get the authentic candidate showing up? Yeah. And that's so hard because often as hiring managers, we we go in, not ourselves. We're like, oh, I don't want to be here. Oh, it's a lot of work. I got other things to do. What a waste of time. Probably not going to hire this person anyways. And we walk in just this negative ball of grouch. And then all of a sudden we're like, yep, see, I told you. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, you didn't even give that person a shot. Yeah, no, it's very true. I mean, I do look, I wonder how often do we have we passed over really good candidates just because we're not in the mood. Well, we like to, I like to talk to people about the difference between a rock star and a superstar. You know, Kim Scott talked about this a little bit in her book. And the thing that I realized a long time ago is that when you hire a rock star, which those are the people that are foundational, they're mm -hmm. really great. You know what? They've probably been at two or three jobs their entire life. Right. They, they probably have been at the same job for eight years before they're ready to apply for another one. Mm -hmm. They don't want to move up. They don't want to take on new projects, but they want to be the person you can count on. Yeah. We want to hire all those people. But then what happens is the superstars, the people that want to climb the corporate ladder and have a hockey stick trajectory of their career, they're, they'll, they'll, they want to change everything, right? We look at them and we go, oh my gosh, how cool would it be to have them on my team? But that's not who we want. We want yeah. that rock person. Well, guess who interviews better? The superstars, because they're Absolutely. interviewing all the time. <laughs> and so these rock stars come in, they bomb the interview because they, they don't have the practice. Mm -hmm. We're not good at actually seeing the potential and getting those things out of them because we didn't, no one ever taught us how to do as hiring managers. Yep. And we pass on all of these amazing people. We hire the superstar and then hopefully we fire them before the ship is burning. Yeah. But sometimes we don't. <laughs> uh, and it's just, it's one of those things that I think we miss it 
because there's so much opportunity to connect with people who aren't good at this stuff. Yeah. You said it yourself. Hiring managers aren't good. Well, guess no. what? Most candidates aren't good at this no. stuff either. No, no, that's very true. And, and, and it's a, unfortunately, like that's the way it's done. It's done through interviews and that, and, uh, you know, that's the way, uh, you know, hiring is done. And if you're not great in a situation like that, but you're fantastic at the job, unfortunately, it counts against you. But as you said, if you were training people and, and training the hiring managers properly and role playing with them, I think that would go a huge long way. Yeah, and it does. Definitely. Well, listen, Ryan, this has been fascinating. Um, all of Ryan's information will be below this video, but thank you, Ryan. There was a lot of really good, good uh, takeaways in there, practical takeaways, which, which we always love. Before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and Core Matters. Yeah. So if you guys want to connect with me, I'm on LinkedIn, or you can go to our website, corematters.com. But I want to let everybody know I wrote a book called Hire Better People Faster. And um, it's available anywhere you can get a book, audiobook, everything else. But if you would like a signed copy, I'd love to do this for your listeners if it's okay, John. Yeah, of um, course. If they go to corematters.com slash free book, uh, help me out with a little shipping and handling. I'll sign the book. I'll send it off to you. You'll have a copy. You can read through our entire process, everything that we teach over here at Core Matters. Uh, although we've developed some new stuff since the book came out, but it's a really good foundation primer for some of our systems and processes. Yeah, listen, fantastic. I'd encourage you to go ahead and do that. Um, honestly, think about it. If you hire one person better, the next person you hire, you hire better because you you read Ryan and Core Matters book and you followed that process. Just think of think of the ROI on that alone, because I guarantee you, if you look back on all those bad hires you've done, probably um, it's probably cost you a lot of time, effort, money, stress, heartache. You name it. Yeah. So I, I encourage you. We'll link to it below. So uh, go ahead and check it out. So listen, thanks again, Ryan. Thank you for watching and listening. See you all again very soon. Yeah.